The lymphatic system, it's primary part of two systems. Your immune system, it's the biggest component of your immune system. And it just so turns out that the largest part of your immune system is in your gut that they're finding. And that's also where you find the largest presence of lymphatics. Whenever you're going to have a decrease in the lymphatics being able to get out, you're going to have trapped inflammation around the interstitial fluid because it's stasis. Okay, there's an actual well, term for it called yep. interstitial inflammatory stasis. Many years ago, I was uh, very sick and we're ha I was having a lot of infections and uh, different type of autoimmune conditions that I never really got an official name for. Honestly, it felt like I had every one that you could possibly list off. It was just inflammation run amok. Within several days, I made the largest shift in how I felt and my uh, symptoms that I've had probably five years up to that point. And I'm like, okay, this is it. This is what I've been looking for. And now I'm just devoting the rest of my life to teaching others that. Welcome everyone. Dr. Mercola helping you take control of your health. And today we're joined by Dr. Perry Nickerson, who is an expert in lymphatics and its movement and circulation and exercise and a whole variety of other topics that you're going to be fascinated with. So welcome and thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me here, Doc. I love talking about the lymphatics. It's going to be a good time. Well, why do you love talking about the lymphatics? Well, I'd have to share my story of how, honestly, working with the lymphatics ended up saving my life. And I truly believe that. Many years ago, I was uh, very sick and we're ha I was having a lot of infections and uh, different type of autoimmune conditions that I never really got an official name for. Honestly, it felt like I had every one that you could possibly list off. It was just inflammation run amok. And I was really mm -hmm. struggling to get well from uh, the traditional approaches that you would take in, in medicine. And even from my own thinking process at the time, even though I've been in healthcare for many, many years, but I never really focused on the lymphatic system. And because mm -hmm. nothing that I was trying up until that point was helping me get better or feel better, or if it did, it wouldn't last long. So mm -hmm. I knew at that moment, I'm missing something. I have to think differently. And then that's what led me down the lymphatic pathway. And then when I found it, and then I started to actually apply the techniques, within several days, I made the largest shift in how I felt and my uh, symptoms that I've had probably five years up to that point. And I'm like, okay, this is it. This is what I've been looking for. And now I'm just devoting the rest of my life to teaching others that. Well, perhaps you can help us understand precisely what you're calling lymphatics and then why that system would be disrupted and what some of the common causes are. Sure. Yeah. So the way I talk about the lymphatic system is is to kind of give it an, an analogy uh, compared to a uh, fish tank. So it's the best way for you to visualize it. So the lymphatic system, it's primary part of two systems. Your immune system, it's the biggest component of your immune system. And it just so turns out that the largest part of your immune system is in your gut that they're finding. And that's also where you find the largest presence of lymphatics. So that's not mm. coincidence. And it's a major part, which many people forget, of your vascular system, which is your mm -hmm. blood flow system. So if you have an issue with either one of those, blood flow and lymphatics, they're, they're going to go together. So as part mm -hmm. of the immune system, its job is to clean out the body, clean out the, the what I call the cellular poop the waste poop of the cells in your body. And anything that gets into the body, like bacteria, viruses, parasites, toxins, things that are already there like cancer cells, anything that's inside of you that needs to get out, that's the biggest player. And if you envision a fish tank, it's got fluid inside of it, that's water, and then you have fish, and those are your living cells. Mm -hmm. And in order to keep that tank clean and functioning well, you need a filter system. And the mm -hmm. filter system is the lymphatic system. If that system goes on the fish tank, then the fish tank starts to become dirty, 
murky, it grows bacteria and fungus, oxygen goes down, and the fish will eventually die because of the toxins in the water and the lack of oxygen. And the same thing ends up happening inside the human body when the lymphatic system tanks go and filters go up underneath. The cells in your body respond just like the fish environment. So the way that you would save the fish tank is by changing the filter system, cleaning the filter system underneath. And that's what I needed to do when I began the lymphatic program. Well, most uh, clinicians I'm aware of consider the kidneys to be the filtration system of the body, not the lymphatic. So how would you reconcile that? Yeah, so stuff is going to go to the kidneys, but the, the kidneys take out what the lymphatics send to it. So it's the transport okay. route. Okay, so okay. in order to go out of the body, you have to excrete it. So you usually pee it out through the kidneys, but you also have yeah. to remember that the kidneys have lymphatics too. So well, if you they, get but they also have a, the lymphatics. quite an enormous blood flow. <laughs> they're, they're Correct. Really sophisticated legal marrows. And that's, it's my understanding, that's the way most of it is filtered through the blood, not through. I suspect, I wasn't aware that, that, that the lymphatics were, played that role, especially in the gastrointestinal system. So how, yeah, how does so it work in the GI all these system? Fluids inter, all these fluids interconnect with each other. So mm -hmm. when you have stuff that comes out through the arterial system, the vascular system, that's the supply side. So that's going to deliver the nutrients and the oxygen and the things to the cells. But in order to get to the cells, they have to cross through what's called the interstitial fluid. And mm -hmm. the lymphatic's job is to keep that fluid clean. So once the cells mm -hmm. use the nutrients, they're going to they're going to create energy and they create waste, metabolic waste of anything mm -hmm. that comes through the capillary. And that waste has to get out. So the veins are going to take some of it, but the particles that are too large won't go into the veins. So then it has to go into the garbage can of the lymphatic system. Then the lymphatic system takes it to the lymph nodes, which are these many toilets throughout the body. And you have about six or 700 of them. And each node kills more things along the pathway. So your immune system bags and tags things that the lymphatics capture, and that tells your immune system what something is and what it needs to do about it. And then eventually it's going to dump its way back into the veins, and then it's called plasma. So it goes from the veins, and then it's going to go from the veins back into the blood flow again, and that's how it's going to make its way to the kidneys. So all of okay. these areas intermix with each other. And if you have a backflow in one area, an obstruction or a stagnation, you're going to have backflow in all the other areas because the pressure has to dissipate somewhere. Okay, that makes sense. So the lymphatics facilitate the excretion of these toxins to the kidneys to ultimately remove them from the blood. Correct. If lymphatics, lymphatics are not functioning properly, that's going to build up backup pressure and cause you problems, which you yeah, experience. Yeah, so all those things almost, stay inside kill, of you. It almost killed you. So what? What, yeah. what, what are the what are the typical causes of that from happening? Why? How would someone suspect this is going on? Well, I always kind of jokingly say that what's going to cause an issue with your lymphatic system is life, L I F E. Mm -hmm. Just the sheer overwhelm of being on this planet, having to deal with stress of all type: physical stress, emotional stress, nutritional stress. Mm -hmm toxic stress of everything coming into the body that's happening. So it just gets overloaded because people don't directly take care of the lymphatic system on purpose. So what do I mean by that? The lymphatic system moves primarily through two different ways, through movement. So whenever mm -hmm. you move your body, you pump the muscles and then that moves the lymphatics and that helps it bring it back towards the veins at the collarbone. So if you don't move a lot, then you're going to be prone to stagnation, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't do a lot of movement. The other one is no, breathing. Well, I, I, would, I would disagree with that. I would say most people don't do a lot of movement. <laughs> yeah, most people don't S move. S sitting is a new smoking. Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So most people are not moving. They're right. sitting all the time, and then they're yes. stagnant. Right? yes. And yeah. then when you sit, you actually increase tension in the body, but particularly in your abdomen where most of the lymph is located. So you get mm -hmm. tension and tightness in that abdominal region. So they don't move a lot. And then the other one is breathing, particularly diaphragmatic breathing. So when you breathe mm -hmm. through your diaphragm muscle that's ab above the organs here, that 
increases pressure and decreases pressure throughout the body, but particularly in your abdomen. So it acts like a pump for mm -hmm. the lymphatics and the vein flow. And it just so happens that the largest lymph node in your body lives smack dab center in the middle of your abdomen called your cisterna chile. Mm -hmm. And that's going to bring the lymph flow back up to your left side collarbone from anything on the lower part of the body and your organs. And most people don't breathe enough or optimally or efficiently through their diaphragm. So breathing is not great. Movement is not great. And then those things stagnate over the years. And I have people that do those things. So they start moving and they start breathing and they may feel a little bit better, but they still have lymphatic blocks. And the reason is the blocks are too big to now be moved by those two things. Movement mm -hmm. and breathing itself are not enough. And the way I kind of describe that is this. If you have a toilet in your house that's backed up, that's like a lymph node that's backed up, okay? Mm -hmm. Every time you flush your toilet, it's going to get closer to the top. Mm -hmm. Sometimes if you keep flushing the toilet, it's enough pressure to actually pull it through so we can go out into the sewage. Mm -hmm. But Sometimes that's not enough. You have to get in there and you have to use a plunger or you have to snake it. And in my world, the plunger and the snake are your hands. Okay. They do it for you. So I'm writing a new book on cellular health. And one of the most, and it really seeking to keep it simple, to identify the primary things that uh, result in almost basically every disease. And in fact, certainly play a role. But one of the mm. key therapies that I'm recommending is movement unquestionably movement. And I've come to the conclusion, I suspect you have too, but I'd be curious as to your thoughts, that the best movement possible, the best exercise possible, although there may be another one here, which I'm curious as to your thoughts on, generally for every health, generally is walking. And if, and if you're doing another exercise, and you might be doing it for competition or something, but if you're doing any other exercise and not walking, I would encourage people to seriously reconsider cutting back on that exercise and giving yourself some more time and walk and do that exercise on top of the walking. Because that is the, that is the primary exercise that every human was designed to do. Now, with respect to lymphatics, I'm particular, and I'm wondering if you agree with that, but I have another question on top of that. Mm -hmm. With respect to lymphatics, it would, you know, I, my experience suggests that one of the ways to facilitate lymphatic circulation is through rebounding. If you're on a little or a mini trampoline or you're up and down because you're really going to put that, you're going to activate those G forces to accelerate lymphatics. So I wonder if you can comment on the walking and the use of a rebounder to improve lymphatic circulation. I love it. They're two, they're my top two without question. Okay. And if you can mix those two together, <laughs> yeah, I think you might be onto something here, doc. Honestly. Um, well, you know, humans were, we're, we're made to move. We're made to walk. We're designed yes. to walk. You're right. So you're using your muscles and you're pumping <clears throat> fluids all over the place, right? And you're really using your calves and your calves act like this distal pump that pumps the vein flow also back up towards your heart, but also the lymphatics as well. And you're swinging your arms, which is moving lymphatics, and you, you should be walking, hopefully brisk enough and without a phone in your hand. So you get some twisting and rotation and torsion in the center of the abdomen. And that moves fluids, too. I always tell people envision wringing out a towel. You know, twisting gets fluids to move. So how about you walk and then you stop for a little bit. Then you kind of jump up and down on the balls of your feet because you have built-in rebounders called calves. Mm -hmm. And you can go up and down like that. As, as well as monitoring your breathing at the same time. Usually I tell people to keep their mouth closed, breathe in and out through their nose, and they'll have more optimal movement of their diaphragm at the same time. And you do your lymphatic. So what I usually teach people is to do those, but then you'll even have a better result when you do some lymphatic work before you walk and before you rebound. Great. I have a minor tweak to that because that, I've uh, been able, fortunate enough to be able to navigate my life to live close to the beach of the ocean, actually. Mm -hmm. And I, so that I go there every day and I walk on the sand without shoes and minimal clothing, unless it's in the middle of winter. And I live in Florida, so that's not too many days mm -hmm. that I'm unable to do that. But what I really enjoy is walking backwards and dancing to good music. 
and just moving my body in as many different directions and flowing it as possible. And I'll tell you, and I do that for at least 15 or 20 minutes going backwards. So I just love it because it, you get the twisting above, you get the rotation and you're moving your arms and your hands in every direction and seeking to move every part of your body that you can. Flowing to the music and enjoying it and having joy, experiencing joy doing it. So it's a wonderful comp and doing it in solar noon. So you're getting photons too. And where I do it on the ocean, you're getting negative ions. So oh, that's, I mean, a, that's, that's, a, that's the that's ultimate, a, I think. Fantastic. Yeah. You, I don't think you can beat, you can't beat that. I mean, you're getting the grounding <laughs> in, hard. the electrons in. Plus the, the singing and the dancing and walking and moving in different directions, which is great novelty for your brain. Yeah. And yeah. it's going to decrease, it's going to decrease your overall stress response and take you out of what I call sympathetic, dominant, hypervigilance, hyperarousal, fight or flight, hang on for dear life of the modern world. And that's big because we find that people who are under chronic stress and the sympathetic nervous system is an overdrive, increases tension in the body. Mm -hmm. And when you increase tension in the body, you decrease fluid flow. Mm -hmm. So you automatically lead to more stagnation of the body fluids from your blood flow in, your blood flow out, and your lymphatics and your interstitial fluid flow. So how do you, would someone recognize that this is an issue for them? And what were the, what, and what, maybe you can describe your personal story as to mm -hmm. how you, you, your life got to the point where you had suffered such misery from lymphatic stagnation. And then what caused you to realize that and, and maybe help us understand your journey and, you know, what you happened to you to understand what this was and how you learned to address it and, and, and. You know, just walk us through that. I think it would be helpful for many. Yeah, I think so, too. It's usually, I'll tell you, most people only find the lymphatics as they've checked everything else off first. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a last thing that they look mm -hmm. at. And, many, and most of it's because of just how people have been told about lymphatics. And most people don't even consider looking at lymphatics until they have a condition called lymphedema, where mm. there's damage to the valve system and a body part, usually the legs or the arms, get abnormally swollen with inflammation and edema because things can no longer drain because they're damaged. Otherwise, mm -hmm. people were not really looking at lymphatics at all. Maybe you would get it across your pathway when you got the cancer diagnosis because then they talk about the lymphatic system there that can get some damage to it when you do some chemotherapy or surgical interventions, right? That's many times what will happen when people, uh, women especially, get some uh, breast explants or implants. They usually end up with some lymphedema in that region. So. The lymphatic system's primary job is to help eliminate swelling and inflammation, control mm -hmm. inflammation in the body. And we find that chronic disease, chronic pain are tied to chronic inflammation. So there's got to be a, you got to look at an underlying reason of, okay, well, why in the world can't my body control inflammation? One of the reasons it might not be able to control inflammation is because your lymphatic system has an issue and you're stuck full of all that waste material that can't get out, which causes inflammation to keep cycling back. So one of the things that I tell people is the longer you've struggled to get better, you've tried a lot of different things to move your healing needle and it's not working. That's a pretty big indication that there's something with the lymphatic system that you need to look at. For me, it was a lot of infections. I would get sinus infections, urinary tract infections. I had three separate episodes of cellulitis. It's a very painful mm. condition in the body. And I had severe brain fog. And almost every single system in my body was trying to secrete something <laughs> to, to heal and protect me. Mm. And then now that I look back and say, okay, well, that makes a lot of sense now that I know that those are all type of protective responses from the body when you cannot get rid of the waste. So I was mm -hmm. more prone to the infections because the lymphatic system couldn't remove the underlying inflammation. And when I started mm -hmm. to do lymphatic work, I no longer got any cases at all of cellulitis at mm -hmm. all. The postnasal drip, the sinus infections, the UTIs and bladder infections, gone. Mm -hmm. 
Bye bye. You were struggling with the those lymphatic too? system. You were uh, struggling if you with these. name it, I had it. I mean, I yeah, had UT, virtually UTIs everything you are, could possibly think of. UTIs are relatively uncommon in males. It can happen certainly as you experience, but it's mostly a female I got them issue. a lot. So I'm thinking to myself, yeah. why in the world am I getting all these things, yeah. these underlying infections? Mm-hmm. And that's because, well, like I said before, my fish tank was a hot mess. Like, mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. You, your fish are going to keep getting sick if you keep putting new fish in a tank that doesn't have great fluid in it. Mm-hmm. And that's what happens when your body is trying to make and heal and recover and make new cells. It's going to really struggle to make new cells when you have not so great of a fish tank that they're living in. But of course, they're going to start to have the same thing happen to them that happened to the other ones because you didn't you didn't clean your tank. So you yeah. get you get caught in this vicious cycle that goes through. So you have to the underlying had to look at the underlying reason of. Why in the world is my body doing what it's doing? So if it can't get out through the lymphatic system, your body has to find other ways to deal with it. Yeah, so I'm I'm particularly curious because it seems like this condition would be more frequent in people who are older. So the older you get, the more likely you're to encounter this because of mm. just the general degradation of, of human phys- biology over, over the time. Uh, so one of the conditions that occurs also that degrades over time is the function of the heart, the ability of it to pump effectively and move the fluid in the body. So one of the conditions of uh, diminished heart function, a sort of heart failure, so to speak, would be this also this peripheral swelling this in the legs, uh, peripheral edema. So how would you differentiate that between the lymphatics and a, and a, a problem with the heart as a pump? I really don't differentiate the two. If you got one, you got the other. They always okay, go so together. Ha- just, ha- tell, us how, tell us how they're connected. Yeah. So first of all, your heart has a healthy dose of lymphatics too. Right? Okay. So yeah, Dr. Gerald Lamole, L-E-M-O-L-E, mm-hmm. uh, a heart surgeon, actually wrote mm-hmm. a lot of several books on the power of lymphatics in uh, cardiovascular disease, mm-hmm. something you need to pay attention to. But Again, so you can have an issue with the lymphatics around the heart itself. So when the lymphatics are stagnated, you get backflow around the heart too. But that pressure that we mentioned before from the lymphatics also can revert back into the veins. So the Mm. veins themselves can become stagnant and slow flowing. And then that's going to make a difference on the arterial side. But then you Mm. actually end up with your vascular system being harder to move. So mm. the fluids become more viscous. They get thicker. Mm. Mm-hmm. And then the heart has to beat more and increase pressure to move the fluids mm. through the pipes. But okay. when blood becomes more viscous, it's very difficult for single red blood cells to go through the capillary because only one can get through at a time. So then you actually now have an issue where you have poor oxygen supply to the mm. underlying tissues in the body. Mm-hmm. And then when that happens, uh, pain's going to show up somewhere when mm-hmm. you don't have enough oxygen in the body. So then mm-hmm. the, it's almost like which came first, the chicken or the egg? Did the heart have an issue or did the lymph have an issue and the lymph has, have an issue and the heart issue? For me, the answer is yes. It's okay, always that, both. That is really interesting because it's such a pervasive problem, people with you know, mild heart failure. Uh, and one of the conditions is, of course, peripheral edema. So I'm wondering right. a uh, number of things. So, and you, you, su- you strongly suggest that they're closely related. And if you improve one, you improve the other. So what would be the typical approach? I mean, and th- this has great impact. This is, I'm surprised to hear this because I wasn't aware of this. And, uh, but it, it seems like it would have great impact on those, the many, many millions of people who suffer with chronic heart failure. That yeah, addressing the absolutely. lymphatics could could be a very powerful experience. So two things. I'm wondering how you would address a program for someone with that, and then what your personal experience is in implementing this program, what you've seen as a clinician. Yeah, great question. So yeah, to, to me, when you have an issue with one of these systems, like the lymphatic system, you're mm-hmm. automatically going to have some carryover with an issue in your vein system, for sure. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's mm-hmm. a given. 
mm-hmm. and then that can backflow into the arterial system. So that's why I like Gerald Lamole's books because he goes into it quite in depth <clears> because he, he actually started doing lymphatic work on his patients before he decided to jump in and do surgeries on these patients. Mm-hmm. So he looks mm-hmm. at the lymphatic system uh, much more in depth and closely. So for me, um, I always work the take and assess the lymphatic system and work on the lymphatic system assessment, no matter what you have. Mm -hmm. So we check the areas where you have the primary gathering and clusters of your lymph nodes and the Mm -hmm. body. And these lymph nodes are these small little mini toilets and they gather in clusters. Now, like Mm -hmm. I said before, most of your lymph is located in your gut. Okay. So Mm -hmm. gut gut issues and lymphatic issues usually go hand in hand. And they're finding a lot through the current research of many comorbidities going with lymphatic stagnation and obstruction. Mm -hmm. And the other place that most of your lymph nodes are located are in the neck. Mm -hmm. One, about one third of the total number of lymph nodes are from the collarbone up, which is quite fascinating to me. And then when I thought about that logically, that makes sense because what sits up there? Your brain, right? Well, they're they're finding the the toxins. Yeah. Your mouth and your respiratory apparatus. So, you know, as a clinician, you know, as a primary care physician, seeing many, many people with sore throats and seeking to identify whether that sore throat was viral or bacterial, you know, the first thing you would analyze is their lymph nodes to see if they're swollen and tender. Yeah. Yeah, you go up underneath the jawline of the neck. And then to me, mm-hmm. I look at the whole system. So I tell people, you can't isolate a lymphatic problem. It's, it's all mm-hmm. or nothing. It's a whole system that communicates with each other. And they're finding from the current research that the waste from the brain drains to the deep cervical lymph nodes in the neck. So if you're blocked in through here, you're going to have an issue up top in the but brain. When, when, didn't the brain, isn't the brain drained to a separate system, the lymphatics? Yeah, you have glymphatics and you have the venous system, the paravenous system, but ultimately yeah. you'll see that they're going to drain to the deep cervical lymph nodes. Oh, okay. So they, they pass yeah. through the system and go there. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So what so you do I've, is that you assess certain areas of the body for uh, issues with lymphatics. One of the biggest signs of a lymphatic system issue are a lot of puffiness, swelling, and inflammation above the collarbones on either side. That's a telltale mm-hmm. sign of some blockages in the lymphatic system because that's the main drain for the lymphatic system. 75 to 80% of the lymph in the whole body goes to the left side collarbone. The remaining 25% goes to the right side of the collarbone, but they Mm -hmm. always work together. So that's the first place that you need to clear when you work on anything is the main toilet drain. Mm -hmm. So when you do your work on the lymphatic system, can you describe what that work consists of? Is it, I would assume it's some type of massage or, or are there other things that you do to facilitate recovery of the lymphatic system? Yeah, doing it by hand is the primary way that I do it, but I also use a lot of vibration type therapy, some mm-hmm. small vibration ball devices to, to begin to move those. Because the, the most important thing is to get movement in the areas and to do it in the right order. Mm-hmm. That's that's paramount to success. Okay. So the, the lymphatic system is going to drain based on pressure. Mm-hmm. So everything in your body, vein-wise and lymphatic-wise, are going to go towards the collarbone. That's the mm-hmm. ultimate destination point. Whether it's and above so the that, collarbone or below. Doesn't matter. It's going yeah, it to the collarbone. It goes from the, the head down and from the belly up. Yep. Yeah, it goes head down. Hands up, feet up, belly up, this way towards the drain. So the Mm -hmm. lowest pressure is the collarbone. The highest pressure is the furthest distance away. So everything wants to go that route. And because Mm -hmm. of that fact, that's how you actually have to release the lymph clusters from low pressure out to high pressure. So so you you clear it from the collarbone out. Right. You start the collarbone lymph nodes and and you go distal to those, either direction. Yeah. Yeah, so these clusters of lymph nodes, the body is incredible. It's mm-hmm. They gather around the primary joints of your body that are supposed to move the most. And the reason that they're there is because you're supposed to move mm-hmm. your joints. Imagine that. Like, yeah. like when you walk. So you're pumping these 
joints. So these lymph node clusters gather at the shoulder joint, at the hip joint, at the knee joint, in the center of the abdomen, and the top of the neck at the first three vertebrae in the neck, occiput C1, C2. That's the largest lymph node in the neck is right behind the angle of the jaw. That's mm. where you're supposed to get a lot of movement as well. So if you lack movement in those joints and you don't breathe as well as you should be from your diaphragm here, your pumps are stagnating. Mm -hmm. And that's why I have people work those six primary areas. We call them the big six because it's mm -hmm. a big deal to work them. Mm -hmm. And then you move. Then you Wait, So, oh, so that you're suggesting this sort of pre-movement workout. Yes, exactly. So, so you're going to prime up pre, those lymph nodes. Pre-exercise. Pre-exercise is a, is a pre-movement. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you prime your lymph flow there, but those are also big clusters for vein flow, artery flow, and nerve flow together mm -hmm. around those areas. And when you work those, you free up all of those. Not to mention that you add proprioceptive sensory awareness to the primary joints of your body before you move. Okay. So c can you give us a little routine that you recommend to your clients or patients as to what they would do for, was it is it five minutes, 10 minutes before they go into a movement uh, approach? Yeah. You go right in before you move and you can even do it after you exercise and after you move. So you can facilitate waste removal after you've exercised. So okay. you do the big six in order. So I usually have people do some rubbing. It can be different pressures. It can be light. It can be a little bit deeper. It can be slow. Mm -hmm. It can be fast. Just don't cause pain when you do it. If you cause mm -hmm. pain when you do it, that too means much. you're gonna you're pressing too hard and you're likely going to tighten up, which is going to defeat the purpose of you doing the, the reset. Mm -hmm. So the first place that you, that you massage and move in all different directions, I like circles a lot spirals and mm -hmm. rotations, are the collarbone. Above mm -hmm. and below the collarbone on both sides, you start there first and you spend the most time there as, long, as much as you want. I usually tell people 20 seconds is a good target. When you open that up, you're automatically then going to move up into the largest lymph node in the neck, which is spot number two behind the angle of the jaw. And you do the mm -hmm. same thing there because now you're going to facilitate everything from that to drain down towards what you already cleared at number one. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. So yes. as soon as one opens up, two naturally flows more because you opened up one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then you're going to go to spot number three, and that's the actual shoulder joint, pectoral muscle, armpit, axillary region, like that, like the width of your hand underneath there. That's spot number mm -hmm. three. Spot number three is going to drain towards spot number one. Mm. So collarbone, upper neck, shoulder joint. Mm -hmm. And then number four is the entire abdomen from below the sternum all the way to your navel, the whole thing. In the Massage midline? that. Yeah, the all over the whole place. Midline the, is great, the entire, but I want you the to entire, get in there. It's the entire the abdominal surface. The whole thing. Because they're fine, okay. especially the midline, oh, because that's where everything so, is going to drain. So, uh, yeah, are they mostly in the midline or are they in, 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 embedded in the it's everywhere. intestinal, intestinal I mean, lumens? The, yeah. Not the yeah, lumen, well, but the largest the lymph node in the body, the cisterna chile, sits pretty much center mass diaphragm. in the abdomen. Yeah, it's going to be between the navel and the bottom of the sternum. That's usually okay. the spot that it's going to be at the halfway point. So but, put a lot see, of your there. liver, yeah, your liver contributes 50% of your lymphatics to the cisterna chile. 50%. Mm, that's a lot. So, yeah. So what I'm telling people is if you're stuck and blocked with poor flow in the cisterna chile, where is that flow got to go if it can't go up? It's going to, to go back out. It's going to go to your yeah. liver, and your liver's not going to be happy, and then you're going to have liver issues, okay? And then you're going to have vein issues in your liver, too, because you have venous issues and lymph issues. So mm -hmm. it backflows into the gut and the intestines, okay? It's one of mm -hmm. the primary things that can lead to leaky gut no. when fluids can't move. So you spend a, a good amount of time at number four because, you know, I tell people that's a hot mess on most people. 
Mm -hmm. And then you go to spot number five, which are the inguinal lymph nodes. That's the crease of the groin. Mm -hmm. Because the crease of the groin is going to go towards spot four. You follow? Mm -hmm. So that's why Mm -hmm. you have to clear four first. If you Mm -hmm. don't clear four first and you went to five first, you're going to send it to a block. That's why you have Mm -hmm. to start from the collarbone and go down. Mm -hmm. Then the last one is spot number six. That's the posterior knee, the popliteal region behind the knee. And that's going to take the flow that's coming up from the foot and the calf. Hmm. Because everything in your foot and your calf is trying to go to the left side collarbone. That's where it's trying to go. Veins and length. It's trying to go there. So in order to get to that region, it's got to get past the abdominal region and it's got to get past the pipe along the spine that dumps into that left side collarbone. That's a long way to go. Yeah. So this whole lymphatic exercise you're suggesting, what's the total time it takes? About five minutes, 10 minutes? Oh yeah. If that, I mean, like if you want to do it quick, it'll it'll literally take you a minute. You just rub and and, uh, I like to do tapping a lot and uh, you can do each point and then bing, bang, boom, go, but you can spend longer on there. If you like, you just have to make sure you do them in the order one, two, three, four, five, six. It's sure, not six, that makes five, perfect four, sense. Three, two, one. Is there is can you integrate the or d- discuss the be- the benefits or the disadvantages of integrating uh, rebounding with this? Because it's uh, you, just from your description, it seems that it's going to be universally beneficial. But you're not doing it in the right sequence. But if you do it simultaneously with the whole body, does that make a difference? Yes. Yeah. So I love rebounding because first Mm -hmm. of all, you're moving your body like most people don't move it and -hmm. you're moving your organs like crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, So it's like you're, you're like a big, uh, what I call slosh water pipe of fluid that needs to, that needs to move up and down. And you would be a slosh if you didn't have any collagen, you'd be a blob. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Right. So the thing is that rebounding is great, but What you'll find when Mm -hmm. you start to do this is if you do that big six first, if you open up these big node Mm -hmm. points first, then you rebound. Oh, so you find that combination is much better. If you do the combination is fantastic, right? And then that'll be the person who will say, you know, Doc, I've I've done rebounding a lot, but when I added that, I Mm -hmm. noticed even bigger changes. That okay. occurred for people. And is that the strategy you used to recover from your own illness? Yes, that's exactly what I needed to do. So once I uh, worked diligently with the lymphatics, mm-hmm. within the first 30 days, the month, I was probably 50% better at least from things that I've been suffering with for five years. And I lost 20 pounds of swelling, inflammation, edema, and body fat just from doing lymphatics. That's because all. I opened up. That's all. The flow route. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah. I that's mean, it, it was, I'm asking you, the Doc. It was something that was so profound, yeah. but I never really looked at it. And I'm in this field of healthcare, mm-hmm. but it wasn't on my radar because I was always looking at uh, musculoskeletal system. I was looking at nervous system at the time. Mm-hmm. But I never really focused on the lymphatic system, okay? So here's the thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're always working your lymphatic system. Most people are Mm -hmm. just doing it by accident. You don't even know you're doing it. So every Mm -hmm. time you move, lymph is supposed to move, and the operative word is supposed to. Mm -hmm. Every time you breathe, lymph is supposed to move. When you go for a massage, you're moving the lymphatics. And this is when people say to me, well, if I'm doing my massages and I'm doing my breathing, I'm doing my movement, all should be good, right? Well, I mean, we would hope so. But like I said before, two reasons why not. Sometimes that those blocks are so deep Mm -hmm. that you got to remove them by hand. But then the reason when you're trying to remove stuff by hand is that you're not doing them in order. People are just rubbing parts trying to move fluids, and they will, Mm -hmm. but you have to do them in a specific order so the physics of the fluid flow, known as hydrodynamics, can efficiently move to where they're trying to move to 
on their own. Mm -hmm. They just, they're just not able to do that because of the obstructions that are there, but also the backflow that's happening because the lymphatics can get stagnant, but they can also backflow. They can go the opposite direction. And they're finding that sympathetic dominance, hypervigilance will do just that. They'll usually cause a backflow on the lymphatics. And where you get the biggest blocks that I've found in my experience are the deep lymphatics. Mm. And they're the ones that live along in your abdomen and along your spine mm. going up through the big, that's the sewage pipe at the street, basically. You know, when you flush yeah, the he, toilets in your house, they got to go to the big pipe. Yeah, so you hadn't, me you you hadn't mentioned... You haven't previously yeah. mentioned spinal, spinal lymphatics. You're just focusing on the abdomen, the, the inguinal area, and then the popliteal. Yeah. So spinal lymphatics are a little bit uh, more difficult to get. They'll start mm -hmm. to move when you begin to restore the big six and get the pressure mm -hmm. blocks opened up. Um, usually I found one of the telltale signs that you've got a deep lymphatic block behind along your spine, particularly your thoracic spine, because you have to remember your spinal cord and your nerves have lymph too. Mm -hmm. And they have to drain to the same place. And if your lymph's not draining, you can stay backed up with inflammation around the spine and the spinal cord and nerves are not going to be happy. One of the telltale signs of that is puffiness, swelling, and inflammation at the sternum bone, your breastplate. That's a big one because okay. it's supposed to be a hard bone. If I find it puffy, tender, or swollen, that's a telltale sign of backed up, in my world, lymphatics and venous flow at the thoracics. Hmm. And that's why that's you want to have good diaphragmatic breathing because that's going to help pull it sucks that venous flow up mm -hmm. and while you want to do your walking and have good rib cage mobility thoracic spine mobility so you can get the movement in motion so whenever you are breathing in and out you can create a bigger pressure difference between your thorax and your lungs and your abdomen and then that sucks the fluid up and out so that's one of the biggest reasons why I like to make sure that you have good mobility in your rib cage and your thoracic spine. Twisting and turning when you're walking and hanging works really great too. If you can hang from something for a period of time, that really begins to open up those ribs along the spine and along the back that get stuck and locked. How long do you hang for? As long as you can. <laughs> so you start you, that, well, no, that, Yeah, but so how long do you thing, hang though, Well, here's the thing. It depends on where you're hanging from. First of all, it's okay. very difficult for most humans to grab something overhead and hang on to it because they don't have good mobility in the shoulder joint and their mm -hmm. thoracic spine is a mess and they don't have grip strength. So it's really mm -hmm. hard for them to hold on to something. You'd be lucky if you have a human that can hold on to a bar for 20 seconds before they got to drop. So what you do is you hang on to something that's not directly overhead so much. It's more like in front of you, like a railing, a banister, a tree branch, something like that. And you just lean into it or you just put one hand up over your head and you don't completely hang, but you let some of your body weight go up into it and you work your way there. Okay, but hmm. if you can put your hands up over your head and hold on directly to a bar for two minutes straight, you're a monster. Like no, that would be I the usually, ultimate goal to do. I pretty much do that every day, and uh, right. I try to go to three to five minutes. Not it's a single, but multiple lips to get up to three to five minutes a day. That's fantastic. I mean, yeah, if you could get most humans to do that. It would be a game changer for them in so many different ways. Yeah, Throw that someone, hanging I'm, I'm, in I'm, I'm with a, your beach routine. Yeah, I'm it. a big fan of dead hanging for sure. And then yeah. you can level it up by doing one arm hanging, which is you know quite a bit more difficult. It's, it doesn't seem as difficult, but it is. <laughs> it's really hard. Oh, it's hard yeah. To get, oh, absolutely. It's hard to get. It's hard to even get thirty seconds with that one. Yeah. Yeah, most you probably find it. Most people, when they're going to get into this stuff, they they they've never done any hanging before, and then mm -hmm. 
to try to reach some big target of a two minute, you know, uh, hashtag beast mode monster hang when you never ha- had done hanging before, you're probably going to hurt yourself. So, you, yeah, you got to go start in small, easy. but yeah, for sure, especially if you're overweight, as most people are, you know, we got 40% of most state, many states being overweight and certainly more than 30% of everyone being obese. Uh, yeah, and, no, that'll I, be tied I say, I say to lymphatics too. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That, that plays a role. So you've been doing this for a while. Have you seen any recent innovations as part- that you're excited about? And well, th- I'll be honest with you. The excitement is that medicine is actually beginning to pay more attention to lymphatics. So mm-hmm. that in and of itself is a check the wind box. Mm-hmm. Um, wh- one of the reasons that they're starting to look at it, I'm finding, is because people make make such significant changes and improvements when you start to work the lymphatics, right? Mm -hmm. So they're saying, wow, we should take a closer look at this. But I think what's moved the needle is what they're finding in relationship to the lymphatic system and the brain. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because, you know, you have this glymphatic system, which we're not going to get into here, the glial cells, the immune cells of the brain, a glymphatic system uh, that's there and along the meninges covering of the brain. They have to work directly with the lymphatic system below it. So that's why they're going to drain into the lymphatic systems of the neck, the deep cervical lymph nodes of the neck. And then what we'll find that we often forget in medicine is that you can't separate systems. You can't separate tissues, that the glymphatics are going to tie into the lymphatics. So the this what they're finding in relationship to the brain, neuroinflammation, neurodegeneration with Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, MS, and the fluid waste management system of the body, they're tying it more to lymphatics in general, which is great. So that's what I'm most excited about. And then that'll that'll pull the thread on them looking at the lymphatic system's role in other conditions, other diagnoses that might seem unrelated to the lymphatic system because you don't have lymphedema or cancer. But what I tell everybody is I always refer back to fish tank. Like mm-hmm. if you have inflammation in the body that can't get out and you have tracked trapped waste particularly metabolic waste and cellular waste of your own cells dying as well that can't get out you're going to end up having inflammation and that that inflammation can manifest in many different diagnostic the diagnoses names so mm-hmm. but to me it doesn't matter because I'm going to clean your fist tank regardless of what name you've been given as your diagnosis because I'm focusing on the fist tank. Yeah, and what, one of the other ways you can do that is a process called detoxification. And uh, certainly lymphatic massage and movement can be part of that. But uh, one of the primary strategies that most clinicians I'm aware of utilize is uh, a sauna, uh, typically far infrared saunas where you're get, getting the body heated anywhere from 140, 170 degrees, and then sweating. That's the key issue is raising your internal body temperature that you're able to excrete the toxins through the sweat glands. So I'm wondering how the lymphatic approaches would integrate into sauna. Is there a specific timing where you think it would be valuable to do this six-phase <clears throat> um, lymphatic massage in in the right sequence prior to the sauna during the sauna after or all of the above yeah i always tell everybody big six comes first before anything Mm -hmm. always comes first because you want to free up those deeper lymph node channels because the the lymphatic system works like uh i want you to think of a tree okay Mm -hmm. you have the leaves of the tree and then you come down into branches, then you go to bigger branches, then you go to the trunk, and then you go to the roots. That's mm-hmm. the same way it is with the lymphatic system. So at the skin, you also have a ton of lymphatics, but that's the end point. That's the superficial lymphatics. And they're going to drain down into the deeper lymph nodes that we showed you with the big six, and then they're going to ultimately drain into the deep, deep lymph nodes that we mentioned before along the spine and in here. So 
sweating is great in the sauna. But I'm going to contend there's no way you're going to sauna yourself out of a deep limp block. That's mm. the toilet that you got to get in there by hand. Remove that. Get those areas and then go in the sauna. Mm. And then you'll have a different experience. Okay, same well, thing if you do cold plunges or you do whatever. And and I always I have this people that do this, they try to do and do detoxification routines through nutrition and supplementation, but it's the same thing. I would coincide that in relationship to doing the lymphatic work at the same time. Yeah, well it sounds to me even the more ideal approach would be take your detox protocol. I like working out before the sauna. Take your detox agents, which would be things like active charcoal, uh, activated charcoal, which is particularly useful for binding endotoxin, which is a byproduct of an imbalanced gut flora, typically too many oxygen uh, tolerant bacteria, which are the pathogenic disease causing bacteria. And uh, the other thing is you could do this, this six, the ma what is it, the magic six or the deep six? Is it, which big six, six is it? but magic the big six, six works six. great because it's like yeah, magic. <laughs> yeah, you do the magic six, and then you do the the uh, uh, rebounder, and then you progress into the sauna, and that that would be sort of a near optimal experience if your focus is on detox. Would you agree? Yeah, that's an absolute fantastic sequence. And then what you'll need to be cognizant of is that when you so you're going to have a lot of stuff that's been trapped in your body for years, if not decades. And then when you open up these channels, things are going to make their way from the interstitial fluid now into lymph nodes, and they're going to try to get out. So you're going to activate your immune system. So you're likely going to go through what some people call a detoxification reaction, because now things are going to come on in and try to eliminate the stuff that they just found and now registers in the lymph nodes until they get out, right? So mm -hmm. a detoxification, when you begin lymphatic work, is quite normal. Uh, sometimes it can be pretty powerful when you do it. And basically, it's where I always tell people it's pretty simple. You feel terrible. You feel like you had a really rough night out, tired, fatigued, lethargic. Sometimes your pain gets a little bit worse before it gets better when you start to move these things around. And that's expected and normal. And you also have to remember, like I said before, that you're not just influencing lymph flow here. You're massively changing vascular flow. So you're probably going to now get blood flow to and away from an area that's been hypoxic for who knows how long. Mm -hmm. And then things are going to start to change now that fluids are moving. Because it's going to be really difficult, if not impossible, to heal when you have stagnated fluids in the body because you just choked off the only supply chain of how stuff gets anywhere. The only way it gets anywhere in your body is through fluid. So you need to make sure that your fluid flow routes are functioning as optimum as they can. And that's what your breathing is trying to do. That's what your movement is trying to do. That They're trying to keep your fluid flow routes open. Mm -hmm. So what that we talked sense? about, yeah, it makes sense. What we talked about earlier, the symptoms of lymphatic uh, stagnation was, yeah. uh, you, we mentioned that, but I don't recall you mentioning pain or chronic pain, but it's from yeah, your- Yeah, pain, I could definitely it, be one for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So why don't you talk about that? Because you didn't mention it earlier, and it seems like it might be a major factor that might catalyze people to consider this as a possible solution. Sure. I don't want to go too, too deep in the rabbit hole on, on pain because, I mean, that's like a week-long show on that one, right? But mm -hmm. in relationship to, uh, let's talk about fluid flow. So whenever you're mm -hmm. going to have a decrease in the lymphatics being able to get out, you're going to have trapped inflammation uh, around the interstitial fluid because it's, it's, it's uh, st stasis, okay? There's an actual well, term for it called yeah, would that, interstitial would, inflammatory stasis. Would, I suspect that would build up pressure. And typically, anytime you have pressure in a body, even if it's a very small area, yeah. it could be literally a few millimeters, that can cause intense pain because your body does, like, does not enjoy concentrated high-intensity pressures localized at all. Exactly. That 
Yeah. Yes. So you'll kick off some of those mechanoreceptors and baroreceptors and pressure receptors, and you'll kick off inflammatory cytokines that get released from the inflammation. And those can kick off signals into the surrounding nociceptors, the centers that detect threat around cells of the body and tissues of the body. And they're loaded around pretty much everything, particularly best blood vessels. And that stasis, that inflammatory interstitial stasis, releases all of that, and it starts to send these nociceptive signals up into the brain, right? And then once the brain hits enough of a threshold, enough of that coming in, then it can kick off a pain response, can be the output. But what you'll also find is that when you have so much inflammation in the body and even maybe inflammation in the brain and poor blood flow into the brain because of lymphatic stagnation, you lose the ability to efficiently activate the pain inhibition pathway. Mm -hmm. So it's not just more signals coming in that cause pain. You actually can have an issue with the body's ability to inhibit pain itself. So it's both. And then these areas that have that stagnation will end up having decreased perfusion of blood flow and venous stagnation, and that will lead ultimately to hypoxia and neuron death. And mm-hmm. then nerves will sense that hypoxia, and they'll usually start increasing their firing pattern, and you become and you get what they call central sensitization. You become very sensitive to things that are input into the system and everything hurts. And then like we mentioned before, if you have the lymphatic stagnation along the spine itself, then those nerve roots become sensitive to everything coming into itself and they react to everything. Mm -hmm. So pain is a complex puzzle for sure. Right. And they say pain is in the brain. Right. I mean, that's what they say in neuroscience. It's in the brain, not the tissues. Well, then you better make sure that your brain functions well. And the first way I'm going to do that is make sure it's got blood flow in. It's got good blood flow out and you don't have lymphatic stagnation in your neck and around the meningeal lymphatics. Because if you have that, then you're going to struggle to inhibit pain. Mm -hmm. So that's why lymphatics in my world are not just about swollen body parts. Mm -hmm. It's about improving every single aspect of your body and its quest to heal, recover, and regenerate and not be in pain. Well, that's just terrific. I really appreciate your insights on helping us understand the connection between lymphatic stagnation and so many different areas of your body that can benefit and improve from addressing this and some very simple uh, strategies, really simple, inexpensive, and not terribly difficult to do at all, but they have some fairly profound implications on your long-term health and enjoyment and ability to experience life at its fullest. So I'm wondering what type of resources you have for people to consider. Do you have books, websites, social media? How can people find out more information about what you're doing? Thank you very much for that. I appreciate that, Doc. Thanks for having me on your show. I had a great time. And like I said before, I, about simple. I always say that effective things don't have to be complicated, right? Yeah. It's pretty simple and profound when you begin to do it and make a shift in how you feel. But yeah, you can find lots of resources on our main website, stopchasingpain.com. Mm-hmm. A lot of content there for free. I'm on all the platforms that you can find information. And we do have workshops and self-care videos. And then I have a book that's actually being in the works right now. So that'll be coming out next year. I'm excited oh, to okay. say. Good. Uh, yeah. It's always a big, big, fun experience writing a book. That's for sure. I've done enough of those. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, there's a lot more to it. I'll tell you. Yeah, it's a, it's a big thing. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, just to thank you so much for your efforts in this area to help people understand what might be contributing to their dysfunction and pain and an ability to enjoy life at its fullest. So uh, I think many people appreciate your kind and persistent efforts to help resolve some of these challenges. Thank you very much, Doc. It's a pleasure. All right. You're most welcome. I know. Thanks so much for watching. Remember, hit the like and subscribe button so you can get more videos that can help you and your family take control of your health.